All right, we are at the top of the hour. Welcome, everybody. My name is Hank Preston, and thank you for joining Net DevOps Live. Joining today's session is Brian Byrne, and he will be taking us through a deep dive into model-driven programmability, looking at NetConf and Yang. During the session, if you have any questions, feel free to use the question and answer panel. I'll be monitoring those and making sure we cover them throughout the session. Otherwise, the first question that usually comes up is where can I get access to the slides or resources that are discussed? And all of those are already published up on NetDevOps Live for the webinar resources for this session. So you can grab all that content there. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Go ahead and take us away. Great. Thanks, Hank. And good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the globe. Uh, as Hank said, my name is Brian Byrne, and I'm what Cisco calls a technical solutions architect, focusing on our enterprise networks portfolio. Uh, I cover, cover a large number of, of Cisco's larger accounts based in the Midwest uh, uh, here in the U.S. And while I, I know that joining a web conference and immediately having the, the instructor talk about themselves is probably not high in our list of priorities for an evening, uh, I want to just maybe take a little bit of, a, of a, a, a discussion around kind of where I came from as it's a little relevant to the conversation today. So uh, as of this week, I will have been at Cisco for eight years. In fact, our phenomenal uh, uh, host for this, Hank Preston, he and I started on, the, on our, uh, the same day at Cisco. We met during new hire training uh, roughly about eight years ago. But prior to that, I spent the first 13, 14 years of my career with a global service provider and their managed services organization. Uh, my last day with that provider, I had a tier three responsibility for roughly 300,000 devices on the network. Uh, and, and the reason why I raise that point is when we talk about this idea of, of uh, network driven or model driven programmability or network automation, uh, this is a topic that I've actually been involved in for an extended period of time. Uh, back in 2005, 2006, we didn't call this automation, we just called it getting it done with less people. But again, this is something that's actually pretty passionate about as it's been a big component of, of what I've done through, through the years. So with that background, I'll probably tell a couple other stories through the presentation, but what are we gonna focus on today is this idea around, we're gonna focus first on the road to model-driven programmability. Why are we taking this move towards model-driven and what does model-driven truly mean? We'll spend some time talking about Yang data models. And again, Yang is our representation of information on a platform. And so we, can, we have to talk about how we're gonna get access to the, that data. We'll talk about Yang in that perspective. And then we'll do an introduction to NetConf, or how do we access that data using a, a transport protocol, and in this case, NetConf. Now, I will call out on all of the slides across the bottom, you'll see a URL down here that points to a GitHub repository. This is where a lot of the code examples that we have posted that we're using in this presentation. This is actually a subset of a Cisco Live presentation that Hank and I do around the globe. It's kind of our traveling vaudeville show. Uh, we were once referred to as actually the network programmability version of Dueling Banjos. Uh, but this is a condensed version of this topic to kind of just bring it down a little bit to focus specifically on, on uh, NetConf and Yang. And with that, let's jump into the road to model-driven programmability. So why are we here? And really the driver is, is that the network is no longer isolated. And, and, and really when we say the network, it's really the network engineer, the network operator that's no longer isolated. And as I said, I came from a traditional service provider background. I was very happy going into work every day at 7.30 or eight o'clock in the morning and staying till 5.30 at six o'clock at night. And I would get my keyboard and if I had a ticket, I would troubleshoot that through the CLI on a platform. And if I needed to make changes to a, to a device in the network, I'd log in through the CLI. But that model's kind of changing in how we operate the network today. We're starting to see more and more uh, outside IT organizations trying to access our devices to make changes. I might be a, an application developer that, that has a containerized application that I need to spin up network services on demand, and I don't want to have to go back to the IT organization to make those changes in the network. And kind of a use case where that came in kind of in my, in, in my history is uh, one of the, the, the offerings that we have with this provider was a phenomenal piece of technology based around Cisco's easy VPN, which is uh, to, to uh, my disappointment has now been deprecated, but it was a very simple way of providing VPN connectivity from a small endpoint. We use this for, for MPLS backup in this case. And unfortunately, when we built this out, we had about 12,000 of these devices out in the network and our template profile that we used in this case was based off of, there was a VPN uh, name that was, used in, that was used or configuration profile that was used. And at the time, we decided to use the customer site identifier. We thought that was a great way to, to distinguish between the configurations. And that was all well and good until we actually had to go through and make a change across all 12,000 devices in the network. And they created an interesting set of challenges is if I had to log into each one of those devices and go into my, my specific VPN command with a unique identifier at the end and make that configuration change in the network, that would have taken forever. And in fact, they probably would just be wrapping up that project today. 
Now, luckily for us in the organization that I was with, we had a really smart guy who knew this thing called Linux bash scripting. And what he did in that case is he actually wrote us a script and it would go out and it would pull in the configuration and it would find that piece of VPN config out, and it would actually parse those details out and he would give us our no version of it. So we would uh, use a no version to back out that configuration command. And then it would generate the new script that we would have with a new VPN identifier that we could easily reference in the future to make those changes. And the output of that would be a text file that I could cut and paste into a router. And I could now do 50 or 100 of these sites on a daily basis. And we actually ran through that pretty quickly. Again, this wasn't network automation that we called it at the time, but this was a precursor to that idea. And that's really kind of what we're driving to around this example. So now you may be asking yourself, Brian, isn't this what SNMP was, to, was built for? SNMP was supposed to be this protocol that allowed us to not only read information off of devices, but make wide scale changes across the network. And what we found is SNMP does really well for device monitoring, traps in, in doing polling. We've been using this in our environments for years. The challenge has been though, is when we try and use SNMP for any type of, of uh, write access to devices, it becomes pretty, pretty complex. Again, it's lack of writable MIBs. We don't have a consistent MIB infrastructure across our environment. If you actually can decode an OID, you're a much better person than I am as those are very complex long strings and not necessarily sure where those are in place. The management systems to provide this access are pretty costly. And there's a lot of security concerns. Again, SNMP v3 is a phenomenal option. I think the last time that I've looked at SNMP v3 was part of my CCIE exam. I hope it didn't actually violate any uh, non-disclosure agreement as part of that. But ultimately what happened is, is based on some of the challenge that we had with SNMP, a group of individuals got together, they formed a committee and they decided to take a look at what does the next generation of network configuration look like? And the outcome of that was RFC 3535. And looking at all the challenges of how we make large scale changes across our environment or large scale operational reads in our environment, a couple of things came out of that. And the first is this programmatic interface for device configuration, a consistent methodology for how I access a device regardless of vendor, so I can make these wide scale uh, attachments to devices and read or write data. We need to work, worry, work on separating configuration and state data. And we say configuration and state how we configure a device and how we do our show commands or our read outputs as to how the device is functioning on the network. We also need to extend this capability to configure services, not devices. If I look at something like a layer three MPLS VPN, I don't tend to look at that in terms of the device. I don't look, when I talk about layer three MPLS VPN, I'm not talking about the PE router or the CE router. What I'm really talking about is a holistic set of devices that represent a VPN extended across an MPLS network. And that's how we need to start looking at configuring the network. And then more importantly, integrated error checking and recovery. If there's a problem, I need to be able to back those changes out or I need to be notified of where that change happens. So again, like in, in typically any committee fashion, this committee actually created a bunch of subcommittees that came out of this. And there was a series of RFCs that were built uh, on top of this. The first that came into play was NetConf. And NetConf was essentially our transport protocol for interacting with devices. And our initial pass to this came in an RFC 4741 in 2006. And, an, and then in addition to that, when 2011 and six, with RFC 6241. Now, the reason why we have this gap between 4741 and 6241 is in the middle of that, and NetConf was the way that we communicate with the device, we quickly learned we needed a consistent methodology for accessing data on the platform. And the way that we brought about that was the addition of Yang or yet another next generation. That's all that Yang stands for, yet another next generation data model. Uh, in, in 2010, RFC 6020 was built. We'll go through what Yang looked like, but ultimately kind of that gap is after 2010 or after Yang was, was defined, the extensions were made to NetConf to actually interoperate with that. Now there's a couple of other different protocols that we can use for interacting with Yang data. RESTConf, which was standardized in 2017 in RFC 8040, as well as GRPC, which is an open source project from Google that's starting to gain some steam. We're not gonna talk about those today, but understand when we talk about Yang, either one of these two protocols can actually interact with it. But at its core, if we kind of look at the stack for model-driven programmability, I have these individual devices, I have individual hardware components, I have device features, and then what sits on top of that again are Yang models that are represented as either configuration or operational, written by standards bodies or vendor specific models. And we'll take a look at those coming up in just a moment. Now, if we think about this term, we hear NetConf and Yang together all the time. And let's talk about a differentiation kind of where they sit. Now, as traditional network engineers, 
This should look very familiar. This is our frame format. We're used to seeing these. How many times have we been to say a Cisco live presentation where we've just done, we've taken a look at the header as, as part of a frame. Maybe we're looking at VXLAN or some type of, of new encapsulation protocol. But if we break it down to its simple fact, I have my header and I have my data. Very similar to what we have in this case of using our transport protocol and our data model in this case. Our transport protocol is going to be in this scenario, we'll talk about NetConf. I use my transport protocol to access data, which is data modeled in Yang. So in this scenario, again, Yang's gonna, our, our Yang model data sits on a device in the network. It doesn't interact with anything. I need to use something to reach out and pull that information. And I'm gonna use NetConf to get to grab that information or kind of where we're gonna focus this conversation on today. And with that, let's jump into Yang. So again, I love this slide because every time I see it, I hear in the back of my head uh, the, the, from the Brady Bunch, instead of seeing Yang, 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 I see Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Again, probably not the best joke in the world, but again, this is what I hear. Uh, people of a certain age, certain generation will understand what that is. But there are a lot of different meanings of Yang as we talk about this. We can talk about something having been written in Yang. Yang is a programming language. I can talk about uh, 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 how I actually represent a piece of data that would be a Yang model. Or I could talk about actually looking at data or an output of that model data that would be the term of Yang data. Now we'll talk about an example of where these three are. I'll be pretty specific when I'm talking about a model versus when I'm actually talking about the data in and of itself though through the rest of this presentation. And to that point, the Yang modeling language is, is, a, is a actually really interesting. So it's under this idea that it's a hierarchical structure that's built of a series of self-contained top level hierarchy of nodes. Really what that means is it's a tree structure that allows me to group like pieces of information in a standardized format so I can quickly look through where that information is. Now I break this overall Yang model down into, two, into this concept of a container. And a container is a group of related nodes. And in a lot of cases, what we'll see is our containers are gonna be our configuration details and our operational details or our state information. And we'll take a look at that as it pertains to an interface coming up in just a moment. Now within each one of those individual nodes, I'm gonna have a list of stored sequence of data. So we think about that list, think about that in terms of if I have a node that represents an interface, maybe say for configuration purpose, well, if I have four interfaces, I have a list of four interfaces, gig 00, 01, 02, 03. And my list is essentially every like piece of configuration or like, like data that's included in that model. Now, as I drill down underneath those individual lists, when I look at a piece of data that's included in that list, that's represented by this concept of a leaf. A leaf is a unique piece of information. So again, if we use that interface configuration piece, if I wanna look at packets in or packets out, my, it's gonna be represented as a leaf within my list, within my container, within my Yang model. And then lastly, what we see, every leaf value has an associated type. What is the data format that I expect to see back? Is it a Boolean? Is it a string? And we'll go through an example of what these look like as we actually take a look at what an overall Yang model is. But to that point, what is a data model? And at its core, a data model is nothing more than a standardized representation of a piece of information. It's something that's agreed upon by a large number of people to represent something. And in fact, if you go out to Wikipedia right now, well actually, not, not right now, you can do it after, after the session, but if you go out to Wikipedia and you take a look at the, at the Wikipedia entry for Yang, the example that they give in that case is not a piece of networking equipment, but they use Yang to actually represent sporting events. I can use that again, however I wanna break that down. I believe they break it down from the concept of their container concept is the type of field that it's played on. And when they talk about the field, I've got individual lists based off of the ball that they use. Is it round, is it spherical? Uh, it, is it played without a ball in that case? But again, we can use that to represent anything. In fact, to that point, if you were to ask me a question, of, you wanted to talk to someone around a CICD model or continuous integration, continuous development model for using network connectivity, I may tell you that you need to talk to, to a, a gentleman by the name of Kevin Corbin. Kevin's on my team and he's probably, as far as I'm concerned, the de facto source of information on that topic. The problem is, is that if I say, talk to the technical solution architect named Kevin Corbin at Cisco, that probably for most of you on the call do doesn't mean anything. Now, if we were at Cisco Live, I may tell you, hey, you need to talk to Kevin Corbin. And I would say, go over to the DevNet and you wanna look for a guy for a guy who's about five foot nine, five foot 10, he's about 220 pounds. That number keeps getting slightly higher every time I tell this story. He's got blonde hair with a blonde goatee. He's got blue eyes. And again, you can start to build an idea in your head of this is what Kevin looks like. This is a typical standard way of how we would describe a person. So again, just a, a common representation of what, that, what a piece of information needs to look like. But we're not here to talk about people or use this to describe sporting events. 
we want to talk about how we could use Yang to represent information as it pertains to a network engineer. We really have two different things that we can use to represent what Yang looks like in our, or Yang in our environment. We can use it for device specific configuration pieces. We'll go through a lot of examples using interface configuration or interface operational data to take a look at kind of how we would represent an interface. And we can use that for a VLAN. We can use a, a Yang model for, for VLAN, which is essentially the network programmability version of Hello World by configuring a VLAN in our environment. But we can also extend that Yang capability to represent something like a service data model. So again, as we talked about earlier, we use that MPLS VPN configuration or that MPLS example earlier. But as a service provider, if I have a new customer that comes into my environment and I need to extend a layer three MPLS VPN across my infrastructure, regardless of vendor, I typically have a consistent set of configuration pieces that are in place. I'm gonna have some LDP sessions that are gonna be set up. I might have traffic engineering that needs to be defined. I'll likely have some level of routing protocol in place as well as a BGP pairing that's gonna happen between uh, my PE nodes and off to, to my route reflectors and I'll have a, a, a BGP configuration that's gonna go off to the CE. And I can represent that overall network infrastructure, that overall network view of a layer three MPLS VPN through a Yang model. What that allows me to do is have a consistent methodology for turning up those services across the network. I can actually turn those up faster, but more importantly, I can tend to turn those up air free, air free again, provided garbage in, garbage out. If I'm putting the correct information into that models, I'm programming the network from that perspective. But again, it takes away a lot of the configuration errors that happen as part of those as well. So with that, let's start taking a look at how we can start working with Yang models. And the first question that typically comes is, is where do these models come from? And they're really kind of driven out of two different places. And the first are these industry standards. And we'll see a lot of examples today coming out of the IETF, but we have a couple of other pieces. The ITU created some Yang models as well. Also, we're starting to see a lot of adoption of open config models. And we'll talk about open config on the next screen for just a moment. But the idea here is these are essentially standardized representation of how it, something would look in the network. So if we think about an interface configuration, whether it's a, a Huawei, it's a Juniper, whether it's a Cisco, whether it's an HP device, how we represent a, a network device or an interface on the network is typically the same thing. I'm gonna have an interface, I'm gonna have a, 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 a configuration that's gonna make that an L2 or an L3 interface. I might have an IP address. I'm gonna, typically I'll have a description that's in place. Maybe I'm gonna have my state, whether it's up or down or not. And I can rely on a standards body to define what that model looks like in the environment because it's pretty consistent across the board. Now what happens though is every vendor though has specific pieces of information on how they configure things in the network. In fact, we'll go back to the original option of this is with the HSRP, VRRP uh, arguments, I guess, of uh, 15, 20 years, I think we're past that. But again, certain vendors are going to implement feature functionality different in their network. Maybe they extend additional capabilities. Another great example here is I can use a standardized model to represent maybe OSPF, but then in the Cisco environment, we, again, we have our not so stubby area, which is a Cisco specific or a Cisco proprietary feature set. The way I would represent that in a Yang model is this idea as a vendor specific model. So Cisco creates a series of, of Yang models that are, are uh, represented on our devices. And these are gonna represent essentially things that are specific to how Cisco deploys the services in the network. Now, where do we get these models? And really the, the, the sole source of, source of truth for these are gonna be located on GitHub. So the first one that we have, and again, it's this github.com Yang models forward slash Yang. This is the IETF and vendor repository for Yang models across platforms. So this is where if you go to this GitHub right now, you could actually go through, you can pull up all of the IETF standard models. You can browse through that directory structure, see what's in place, take a look at the information contained within those models. They read a little bit like a text file, but we'll talk about in just a moment how we can parse that data out and kind of look at it more of a tr traditional tree structure. But there's also a subdirectory there that actually set, is for vendors. And this is where actual vendors, this is where Cisco publishes all of our Yang models across the platform. And if you drill down through, if you actually take a look at this screenshot off to the side, we're actually looking at vendor Cisco here. We see a couple of things. We see common, and then underneath that, NX, XE, or XR. These are our iOS releases where these Yang models are contained at. And then as you drill down into those, we'll see our individual software releases. As we add new software releases, we'll add new models that come into play. Now, Open Config is a little bit different. So Open Config is a relatively new player, to, excuse me, to the Yang space. And Open, conf, uh, or Open Config is essentially a consortium of, of uh, traditionally, uh, we'll say service provider or web scale providers. Uh, but you could actually go out and apply to be part of Open Config. But their 
uh, their mandate is to go out and start building Yang models that are truly vendor neutral to remove the, the need to actually use some type of vendor specific model. Now we don't really go into a whole lot of detail around what open config is today, but just understand they store their, their Yang models in different uh, locations. Now, the other piece that comes along with this and we'll take a look at this coming up is, this is great if I wanna get a view of what all of the Yang models on say a specific software release are, but what does my platform support? Well, the source of truth for that is actually going out and asking the platform, what do you support? And we'll take a look uh, coming up in a little bit on another slide as to how we can take a look at that from an example perspective. So now that we talked about where we get those pieces, how do we actually represent that Yang data model? How do we represent that in a data format? So again, a model is a representation of the data, but if I actually want to pull that information, I'm going to pull it back across, I'm going to pull that information out and it's going to be modeled in a format. And that format could be a lot of different structures. I could use that in a Yang language, although we typically don't represent it from that standpoint. But typically what we'll see is XML or JSON. Now we're going to focus on XML today because as we'll see coming up as part of the NetConf standard, NetConf only deals in, in XML. Now if we were talking RESTConf, and I can use RESTConf to actually query a device for, for Yang data, RESTConf calls for the ability to actually use XML or JSON. So just understand how we represent that data from a formatting perspective is going to be more tied to the transport protocol than it is actual Yang in and of itself. So that point, how do we work with those Yang models? And I, as I said, we can go out to that GitHub repository, we can clone that repo down, and you get a bunch of .yang files. And these are the, Yang, the, the individual Yang models themselves. Now, the Yang model does represent the documentation set. And if we were to actually just go do something like, say, you know, open IETF interfaces.yang, we would see this nice long text file with a lot of information around who wrote it and maybe some descriptions as to what the individual fields are. But really what we want to do, if we just want to parse it down to take a look at our tree structure, we can use a tool called PyYang. So in this case, PyYang minus F tree, say displayed in a tree format. And this will actually give us a tree or a hierarchical structure of what that Yang model looks like. So to that point, PyYang is, a, it's, again, it's just a Python li library for, for uh, displaying and validating Yang files. We can see this in two formats, tree, which is gonna just be a text output, or JS tree, which is gonna give us an HTML format. Maybe we wanna convert that to HTML because we wanna store that on a centralized web page if, we, if we've got a, a, a team that's actually working on building some network automation scripts as a reference structure. But what we have left is ultimately, this is my Yang model. Now, I'm gonna call this out because I actually have a couple get questions on this from time to time. You're gonna, we tend to use the term model quite a bit, but if you look here in this first line, we'll see this word module. Now this is a very specific nuance in the RFC, but when we talk about a, a standardized Yang representation of data on a platform, we call that the Yang model. And that may be including uh, individual components, maybe for, I for interfaces, maybe for IP addresses, maybe for ACL, uh, routing configurations. But when we look at individual p uh, an individual Yang structure that's referred to as a module. Now I will tell you there is a sp there is a designation to that point. I typically just say the word model. Please don't hold it against me from that standpoint. But if we look at this tree structure, the first line that we see here is the module name, IETF interfaces. And this makes sense. We actually this is the this is the Yang model that we're looking at. Now, if I step through this output, I see two pieces here. The first thing that I see is my container. And again, these are groupings of like information. And what I have here is at the top, I see interfaces for my top container. In my bottom container, I see interfaces dash state. And what this is, this is essentially my container for configuration details and my, con my container for operational details are essentially the, the, the same equivalent of my show output in, that, in those scenarios. Now, as we drill back down through this next bracket, this is actually representing a list. Now, again, on our platform, if we're looking specifically at the Yang model itself, we don't have multiple instances of this list. We just know that if I have to represent it, I'm gonna use this same information to say represent 000102 from an interface perspective. We'll take a look at what that looks like in data in just a moment. But again, I have lists for both of my containers. And if, now, as we continue to drill down through, this next option here is my key. My key is essentially going to tell me which list entry am I looking at. So when we look at our data piece, our key is gonna be represented by gigabit ethernet 01, gigabit ethernet two. And my key is essentially just saying which list, uh, list member am I looking at? Now, as we take the next step down, this is an actual piece of data. This would be a unique piece of information on an interface, and this is where we call a list. So underneath each list option, we have a leaf, uh, pardon me, a, this is our leaf, excuse me, not our list, but underneath each one of our lists, we have a leaf value. And again, this is a unique piece of data as part of the overall data structure that's in place. 
Couple of other pieces to call out as we look at this. So if you notice, I've got a blue box around RO. At the top, we see a bunch of RW. This essentially tells us whether we it's read-only or writable in this case, and we would expect this. We would expect for our configuration details to be uh, writable and our operational data only to be readable in the platform. Now our question mark represents an optional piece of data. Now what this means is if I'm going to maybe say make a configuration change on a platform or if I'm gonna actually retrieve information back, if it's listed as optional, I don't have to have that on the platform. Probably what's a little bit more important to call out in this case are the mandatory fields. So if we look at something like say, our first line down where we see our interface name, and this would be represented as say gigabit ethernet 01, we would expect that to be a mandatory field. Otherwise I wouldn't have an idea what I was actually looking at as part of the platform. So question marks are optional. Again, our enabled state, in this case we're showing enabled is my interface up or down. From a configuration perspective, that's an optional field. We know that it's optional because as a network engineers, we probably have all gone through and cut an interface configuration out maybe for a complex switch port config. And maybe we, we've dumped that over to another interface and it was in a shut state we didn't realize and we didn't have any network connectivity because none of us have ever done something like that in the past. So again, not, it not necessarily has to be part of the configuration. Now the last piece that we have off over here to the side, this is our data type. And what this is representing, and this is essentially saying in the model, this is the data that, I, the, the format of the data, the type of data that I'm expecting to get back. And I've got a lot of different options that are here on the screen. We'll talk about this, this uh, date time format down here at the bottom, but maybe if we look up towards the top under our enabled state, I see that as a Boolean. So if, it's, if my interface is going to be enabled or not, that's a true or false. If I'm making a configuration change to the device, and I'm, I'm, making a, I'm writing a config change to the enabled uh, place in the, in the Yang data model, and I send a string value of, of up or something similar to that point, it generates an error, and essentially my data doesn't apply to the device because it generates an error code. That's backed if we think to that RFC 3535. We need to have some level of error checking that's in place to ensure that we're just not implementing poor things across the network. Now, as if we look at this place where we see Yang colon Yang dash date and time, what this is actually sta stating is, is that we expect to see this information supplied in the Yang format representing date and time. Again, this is just another standardized representation of how we actually represent time in an environment. So again, this is the, where this hierarchical structure comes into play, is that I now understand, if I'm gonna take a look at my last change piece, I understand what the value of that's gonna come back because maybe I wanna pull that into a script and I wanna use that to parse information out to, under, to, to understand when the last configuration or the last uh, read change was made on my device. So stepping forward, let's start talking about network device data and Yang. So how do we interact with these devices? We're gonna use NetConf, so again, understand that Yang, I've got Yang data on my agent or my network device in and of itself, and I'm gonna use NetConf to reach out to that information, and I'm gonna use my manager, essentially my client or my laptop to actually hit that agent. Now that agent process on most Cisco devices is referred to as ConfD, so if you hear me talk about that, just think of that as the NetConf process or the, Net, the NetConf uh, uh, function that's running on the, the, the device in and of itself. And what I can use is, again, in this case, I can use NetConf to retrieve uh, IETF interface data. Now, in this case, again, there's a script configure or a script example that's in place. I can use my example one Python, and all I'm doing in this case is I'm getting my information data. We'll talk about what a script like this would look like. And again, I see my XML representation of the data. So this is not a Yang model any longer. This is Yang data. In this case, the first piece that I have that's across the top here, this is an XML namespace. And the important thing to note on the XML namespace is towards the end where I see this Yang colon IETF interface, uh, IETF dash interfaces. What this is telling me in the XML namespace, this is my capability, or this is the Yang model that's gonna be represented as part of this data in this case. So again, this maps, as we start looking about how we map this back to what we saw earlier in our, in our Yang data model, our Yang data is being represented in the same format, but we understand where we're seeing that information. Now what I see the next step down is this is my interfaces container. So this is back to my configuration representation of Yang data within that Yang data model structure. This is my, my container structure that's in place. And then what I see here is this next blue block, this is a representation of a list entry of my data. So in this case, I have gigabit ethernet one. If we look directly underneath that, we see our other list entry or our other node of, of data in this case for gigabit ethernet two. 
So underneath my individual node entry here, I have a leaf value. And again, I see my name for Gigabit Ethernet 1, my description. And if we take that, if we were to put this next to, uh, just put, put this, compare and contrast this next to the Yang data model as opposed to the Yang or model uh, uh, XML data, we would actually see there's a direct correlation to these values. We see those represented in the Yang model. Now, an interesting piece that's here, and I kind of want to call this out. We're talking about this being a hierarchical structure, and I'm going to use a term that we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about today, but this idea of an augmentation. Now, one of the challenges that we have, if I do a show run on maybe one of those uh, 6800s that I have running in my network, and I get 2,000 lines of configuration, and I keep hitting my tab button all the way through the environment because I have this long, long representation of configuration. One of the ways that Yang combats this is by creating this hierarchical tree. So what I have in this case is this is actually referencing, if we take a look here where we see our Yang IETF-IP, this is actually referencing another Yang model that I'm pulling into my tree structure. And this is called an augment. We don't spend a whole lot of, we're not gonna talk about augment in detail here, but if, if you're kind of drilling down through, you're going back and reviewing at a later date, you're trying to figure out why that's there. Just think about it in terms of, we're just augmenting this existing data structure by pulling in another Yang model to represent a piece of information. So in summary, Yang fills kind of three roles in, in, uh, in, the, in the environment. First is the data modeling language. And again, it's, there are a lot of really smart people that actually use the Yang modeling language to write uh, the, these Yang models that we use. But Yang models are created to create a standard data model for network data, a representation that everyone can agree upon. This is what it should look like so we can use this across a multitude of network devices and in our network automation scripts. And then lastly, once we take that data model, when I actually use that to, to pull operational configuration details out, this is referred to as Yang data, or this is structured data in a Yang format perspective that we're gonna be formatted in either XML or JSON, depending on the protocol that we're using, NetConf or ResConf. And with that, let's transition to talking a little bit around NetConf. So the NetConf protocol, we hit a lot of these uh, points at the beginning, but just to kind of maybe reinforce a couple of these, the initial standard came out in 2006 with an RFC 4741. You may still have some devices in your network that talk, uh, that talk the original uh, implementation of NetConf or NetConf 1.0. The challenge with NetConf 1.0 is there was actually no standardized methodology for accessing that data. NetConf was not coupled with Yang yet. That actually came around in, 60, or in, in 2011 with RFC 6241. And really what we see now is essentially any place that I'm, I'm using a NetConf configuration protocol to access a device, I'm using it to interact with, with Yang data across the, the network. But it does not explicitly define content. That's where that, that, that marriage between NetConf and Yang come into play. Yang is, is essentially what that content's gonna look like. Now again, Network engineers, we love protocol stacks, and if we talk, if we take a look at this holistically, we can break that count down into really a couple of key components. The first piece is what's my transport, and, and what I'm gonna use is essentially SSH. And we'll take a look at what that looks like from an SSH protocol level in just a moment. But once I establish that connection or I'm using my transport of, of SSH, what I carry in that is going to be XML formatted data. And I, really, and I have three pieces that are tied to that. I have a messaging format that's gonna be RPC, my operations, or again, what am I going to do with the device? Am I going to get a configuration? Am I going to edit a configuration? Am I going to make a change or read a change in the environment? And then ultimately what I have is my content is I'm going to have data. This is what I'm going to package up and I'm going to maybe read or I'm going to, I'm going to make my configuration change. And we'll take a look at each one of these directly. And at that point, we talk about our TCP IP method is SSH. And again, we can actually test this. If you've got a, an iOS uh, XE device in your network or an NXOS device, hopefully in a lab, let's not do this in our production environment, and you're running a software release in iOS XE, that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be really 16.5 uh, 16 or later, probably should be looking at something like 16.7 to, to do testing. But if we just go to the CLI, we enable NetConf, that turns on the ConfD process, and I can actually just take an SSH session, and I can do SSH, my username and IP address, dash P for my port, using port 830, S for my TCP IP service, or my SSH service is NetConf, and I can log in, and I am now communicating NetConf to that device. So this is my SSH login capabilities. We have to authenticate as part of NetConf, and then what comes back is a hello. So my far side of the network or my agent on that platform comes back and says a oh, hello and a couple of pieces of information are here. The first is these are the versions of NetConf that I talk and you'll see base 1.0 and base 1.1. 1 
And then I'll have a list of capabilities that come back. And those capabilities are essentially the Yang models that the platform supports. And when I talk about what's the, how do I know what a device supports, well, the authoritative source to that is actually just go out and do a get capabilities. And we'll use that. We'll talk about how to do that with, with Python just coming up in just a moment. But I get that list of Yang models coming back. And then what I have are my, my laptop or my device that I'm actually sending that from, I actually send a hello back the other direction and I tell it what capabilities I, that I'm capable of. And frankly, that's just gonna be what versions of NetConf that I can communicate with. We don't want a NetConf like this though. And again, this is great. It's a great learning example to kind of talk about how the flow works, but could you imagine trying to write XML and then paste that into a, into a, a terminal emulator of some type and actually send it off to a device? It's not really efficient. We wanna use something like Python or maybe another programming language. We'll take a look at a couple of examples of that coming up in just a moment. So once I've established a session and I need to start sending receiving data, the way that I'm going to send my messaging format is gonna be through RPC. And the important thing to keep here is because again, those net count streams could be pretty long, pretty complex. If I'm pulling a, a complex data structure that's coming back from the far side of the network, maybe I'm getting all of the operational data for a series of interfaces. What happens is I associate this idea of a message ID. So I send my RPC uh, request off to the, the device and I have a message ID specified with that. And we'll say that ID is one, two, three, four. So my first get request is one, two, three, four. My second is gonna be five, six, seven, eight. When the device responds back, if I'm responding to the first request, I send an RPC reply and I tag that same message ID, one, two, three, four. So what happens is when I get that back to my, to my manager, my agent, I know how to reassemble that data into a standard data, into a single format if I'm having to break that up over multiple packets across the network. So but what can I do to a device? And there's a series of operations that we can use. And again, these are the standardized uh, options that are, that are uh, defined as part of NetConf. And we're really going to kind of focus on the first three as part of the uh, as part of the, the rest of this session today. And we've got this. The first two I want to talk about, and these are very specific, and there's specific use cases around these. I have a get and a get config, and the important infer the important differentiation between the two is get allows me to get both running and operational data. So we'll have an example that comes up in a little bit where I believe we're gonna put, if I remember the, the script correctly, that we're gonna use it, we're gonna use a get, we're gonna pull our IP address and we're gonna pull some, uh, uh, some uh, excuse me, some, some packet information or packets in, packets out as part of that script piece. Now, the other option, get config, get config allows me to access only configura configuration details. Now the difference between these two is with get, I can only target the running configuration. We'll talk about targets coming up in just a moment, but again, I'm gonna do a get, it's gonna be essentially what's running in the platform in itself. With get config, I could actually do a get config against say my startup configuration, because I wanna know what that configuration is gonna look like should I reboot that switch or that router for one reason or another. Now, if I wanna make a configuration change to that platform, I'm gonna send an edit config, pretty self-explanatory from that standpoint. We've got a couple of other options, copy config or delete config as they sound. I can copy a configuration from another target store or if I wanna delete a piece of configuration out. Uh, commits tied to something like say an XR platform, we have the concept of a commit versus just a save. And then the, the last three are kind of a little unique and I, I tend to get this question a lot. The first is, you know, if I can use a network, a network automation script, I can quickly make changes out in the network. The challenge is that if both Hank and I are trying to make a modification to a device, how do we ensure that we're not overwriting that configuration. We're not kind of stepping on each other's toes. And the way that I can do that is I can actually go through as part of say my Python script, I can send a lock. And what that does is essentially that locks the NetConf process to essentially my, my host session that, that's going onto the device. And I can actually just interact with that, that information. Now, if I don't clean up my config, which I've been known to do from time to time or clean up my code, and I don't unlock that configuration when I'm done, and I should do that with something like say an unlock and then gracefully close down my session, but if I don't, and Hank's gotta go in and make a, make a configuration change to that device, or maybe he needs to query some information, he can actually use NetConf to send a kill session and actually terminate my session and knock me off the device. So I can't inadvertently lock uh, everyone else in my organization out of the device for making configuration changes. Now I referenced this back on the last slide, but every action that I take on a platform, I have to send that against a, essentially a data store on the, on the device. Now there is one mandatory data store and that's running. Again, to be expected, we're interacting with devices that are powered on and are actually passing packets. So every device actually has a running data store in our environment. Now I have the ability to extend to different data stores across the platform. I could use something, some platforms have the ability to have a startup uh, data store. 
I can do something like a candidate. So if I'm looking at an XR platform, I may have a candidate data store where I'm gonna make a modification to the candidate, and then I'm gonna commit that configuration to the running config. The other option that we see in iOS is this idea of a URL data store. What this allows me to do is, say I have a configuration uh, that I'm keeping on maybe say a TFTP server or an external file, ser uh, file server. I can actually do a, a use that, that external uh, a URL location, essentially specifying where that file is stored at, and I can use that to do a copy config to a target to a target data store somewhere else. Maybe I want to use that to back up a configuration or something similar. And again, every netconf message must target a, a, a data store, and we'll talk about kind of this example here with this m dot underscore get config running. We'll talk about kind of what that really means. So. How do we communicate with the device? We, we kind of got an idea of kind of what that protocol stack looks like in the environment, but what is this flow if we were gonna sit down and we were going to use NetConf to access a piece of Yang information on our device, how would we go about writing this? Or how would we go about kind of starting up that, that, that script? And the way we're gonna do this is again, the first step that we're gonna do is we're gonna connect to the device and say hello. We're gonna define our authentication parameters. And we'll go through an example of what each one of these looks like in code coming up in just a moment. But as I connect to the device and say hello, and what comes back is I retrieve my capabilities. I'm gonna ask the device, hey, can you tell me all the Yang models that you have in place? And I'm going to, maybe I'm gonna pull that out and I'm gonna send that off to a text file so I can take a look at everything that's running on that, that platform. Now, that's one way of going about it. Maybe we wanna go out to the GitHub repository, but again, if we're not sure what a device has, we're gonna get that list of capabilities and we're gonna start investigating what's there. Hey, that looks really interesting. I think I can maybe use that to make a configuration change to the ACL or I can, I can read interface statistics or maybe make a BGP configuration. Now, once that's done, say I wanna make a change to the device, I'm gonna compose that operation. I'm gonna do a get config, or in this case, I'm gonna actually pull some configuration details in. So I'm gonna compose my operation. I'm going to use my authentication parameters and I'm going to send a get config, and we'll talk about an example of maybe how I can filter that information coming back. And when I package all of that up, I'm going to send that with an RPC. So I'll make an RPC off to the, to the device, and, and I, again, as part of this get config. The agent's gonna take that information, it's gonna process it, it's gonna retrieve that data and it's gonna send it back to me with an RPC reply, specifying my message ID so I know how to tie it together. And then my manager advice, I'm gonna process that data. Maybe I wanna do something funky with uh, the output of it. Maybe I just wanna send it off to a text file or print it out to a terminal screen. But essentially that's kind of what the flow is gonna look like as we, as we walk through some of the examples coming up in just a moment. So with that, let's jump into talking about NetConf and, and Python. And the first piece is we went back, we talked about kind of our SSH option and we said we don't want to do that. Well, Python, again, is our de facto uh, uh, network kind of uh, pro, pro, uh, programming language that we use. But when we talk about this, I've got my full NetConf manager and this is essentially NetNC client. So I'm going to use NC client to interact with the device and in, in, uh, in, in particular, I'm going to use this manager process. Now we'll talk through kind of what's going on here on the side of the screen and then we're gonna reuse a lot of this capability across the rest of the other examples so I don't have to explain it on every side. But ultimately what we're doing is we're simplifying the, the, the communication. So in code, I have from the NC client library, I'm gonna import manager. So I'm gonna import the manager function. And in this case, I'm defining a variable of M and I'm using manager.connect and I'm gonna specify all of my details. So again, my IP address, I have my port, my username, my password, and this next option down for host key underscore verify equals false. Now what this states here is essentially if I, if I attempt to make my connection to the device and I don't have this entry as part of my code, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna check as I get the SSH key for the other device, if I don't have a copy of that key, I'm not gonna accept that connection. So all we're doing here, and that's again, that's a security uh, feature that's in place. This is great if you've gone through and actually pulled SSH keys off of all of, all of your uh, network devices. In most cases, we don't have that stored in, in our environment, so we're gonna do our host key equal verify false so we can establish our session. Now, we have, we've defined our session, we're gonna use this to say hello, we're gonna do a bunch of things underneath, and we're gonna send our m.close session because again, if we open a session, we wanna close it, otherwise we're just chewing up resources across our platform. Now, once we've done that, we wanna say hello. I wanna get my list of capabilities. So I talked about earlier, I want to use NetConf to actually go through and tell me what Yang models that platform supports on, this, on the end of the network. And I can use this idea of, of essentially of, of get capability or, or, uh, or my get my, my list of server capabilities. So what we're doing in this case, slightly different, 
So in this case, we're using with manager.connect and we're gonna specify that value as of M. Now the reason we're doing with with M in this case is because essentially once this is done processing these next series of commands underneath it, it's automatically gonna close our session. So if we get in the habit of using with within the kind of the main body of our code to, to, uh, to establish our connection, we don't necessarily have to worry about uh, closing out our session, just probably a little bit more efficient way to, to walk through this. Now, we're pulling a couple of pieces in here. The first is from device import or info import iOS XE1. This is really where we're just gonna bring in our information to kind of fill in those, those uh, light, light pink uh, blanks as to our username and passwords. And then once that's done, we've got a couple of different pieces. So what we have here is we've got, we're just gonna print here are our netconf capabilities. And for each capability in m.server capabilities, so what we're doing here is we're using all of those values that we associated to m, so IP address, uh, username, password, host key, verify. We're going to use essentially the 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 NC client or the the NC client manager cap to get our list of capabilities. This is a function that's built into that. We're going to pull all those capabilities in. And we're just going to print that information out. Now, if we look at this as an example, and this is edited down, if we were to actually run this, it would probably be about four or five pages long of terminal screen output. But this is the response that we get back when we run this get capabilities. And there's a couple of pieces that that I want to call out here. So the first, this blue box, these are our base netconf capabilities. Essentially, these are the base functionalities that we can, that the end device or our network device can process from a netconf perspective. And then what we have in our green box, these are our data models supported. So again, this is what we're coming back with our list of capabilities. Now, these are some very long strings and there's a lot of information here. So we're gonna actually break these down individually so we can kind of get an understanding of what's going on in these so we can actually parse out what a lot of this, these details are. So we have here, we kind of have our, our, uh, our uh, capability that's listed at the top. So we're actually pulling one of the, the specific capabilities from the previous slide of our two formats. And then we've kind of got our nice little key, colored key down below. In the first place that we have is our model URI. So this is gonna be our XML namespace. And as we see here, as we kind of parsed out some of the additional details, we see Yang IETF interfaces. So this is telling us that the platform has support for the IETF interfaces. And again, our next line down, we have our module name and revision date. So our module name, IETF interfaces and revision. And this is our, our essentially, this is, this is just, a, this is a date associated with it. Essentially, just think of this as essentially, the, a, it's a revision name or number that we're using in this case in, in this format, we're using it in a date format. Now, next line that we have down is our features. And again, these are a little bit more advanced topics as it pertains to NetConf. It's probably not necessarily as we're starting to work with devices, but understand if we really wanna get into this, take a look at the RFC to get an understanding of really kind of what these additional functionalities have down. And then this next line down, this red box for deviations. There's essentially a deviation is calling, it, it's, a, it's representing a model that, or a, another model that modifies the specific uh, uh, Yang model that we're looking at in this case. So in this case, deviations, again, it's a little bit more of an advanced topic that we're not covering today. If you have questions about this, I'm sure Hank can help you out in the chat or we can actually, after the fact, we can get into the WebEx team space and happy to provide you a little bit more detail around that. Now. That would be the, the top list, that top block starting with URM, that's gonna be our, our uh, IETF interfaces module. What we have the next line down is this is gonna be our, this is the Cisco specific vendor models. Now, the one piece I wanna call out here is that we actually look at this HTTP Cisco.com, yada, 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 IETF IP devs. Really what this is, is this is not a URL. This is not, I can't paste this into a web browser. This is actually just the, the name of the Yang model that we're using. It's the format we've decided to use moving forward. So with that, we're gonna go through some configure or some options to automate your network with NetConf. Now, understand that the options that we have here, if you've got any history of actually doing any kind of this, this base network automation, you've written some Python code, you probably find these to be pretty rudimentary and probably you could tell me a much better way to do this. We got together, sat down, and kind of wanted to write a very efficient, clean code to do this. They're written in a very specific format so we can kind of talk through from a learning lab perspective. Uh, but with that, we've got a couple of options here. So the first is, and I, I used this example earlier, is that if I wanted to do something like get interface details from a platform, well, there's a couple of ways that I could go about doing that. I could just do a get config off of the device and I could pull everything in. And then I could use Python, Python to parse through all that data and find the specific information. Probably not that efficient. And again, depending on the size of the data, that's pretty, it could be a pretty hefty data transfer. So what we can leverage is this idea of an XML filter essentially to send off to the end device. We send the filter to the end device as part of our, our get config request. Or in this case, we're doing a get, so we're, we're actually pulling uh, from our running configuration. But as part of my get, I send the filter along. And what happens is when the, end, when the agent on the network device is processing that information, essentially it, it takes that data, it slams it against the filter and only sends back what we're asking to filter. So 
As we step through this, we kind of go down a couple of lines. We've got some of the things that we're importing. We'll talk about XML to dict in just a moment, but I've got my netconf underscore filter open, and then we've got our filter name, and we're reading that in. Now, what does that filter look like? And in this case, it's just an XML structure that's saying, hey, this is the data that I wanna see back. So take that full you know, get, to, get that we're doing for our full level configuration, just parse it against this XML snapshot and send me back the information. Now, how did I get this filter? Well, in most cases, I kind of cheated. What I did first is I actually did a full get across that device and I pulled that big snapshot of information back across and I went through and I used it and I parsed out the XML that I wanted and now I have a reusable piece of code that I can use in other cases. That's kind of the beauty of NetConf and Yang is that the first time that I go about trying to do something, I can actually just do it once in CLI, I can pull that information back and I know what I'm specifically looking for in this case. But if we notice in this scenario, I'm actually looking at kind of two key pieces we should notice. The first is, is I'm pulling I or uh, I'm pulling information that's coming out of my interface. So the third line down, or pardon me, the second line down where I see interfaces. This is the interfaces container of IETF interfaces, so configuration details. And I want to see information specifically under the list option for Gigabit Ethernet 2. And then as I go back down a little bit more, I see interface-state. Again, the IETF interfaces module, and I'm going to pull my list details for my operational data. So what happens is, is I take that information and I build that, that net count filter. So again, I've got my variable for net count filter. And if we look down where this arrow is, my net count reply. So I'm defining a variable and I'm using m.get. So all of that authentication details or session details associated to m. I'm sending a get, which is gonna target the running configuration. I'm gonna send that net count filter and I'm gonna get a bunch of information that comes back through. Now the next piece is I process and leverage XML within Python. So what I'm doing in this case is I'm actually using a pretty powerful Python library called XML to dict. And what this does is it takes XML output, converts it to a dictionary. So now I can actually parse through those key value pairs to actually pull that information out. And what I have coming back down through is I'm specifying the format that I wanna see that in. Now, we take a look at our Git interface details. Again, what I have here is my interface details for Gigabit Ethernet 2, my description, and again, on that data, and I get my nice formatted information out. Now, as we start talking about our next level down, our get interface details with, with XPath. So XPath is a really cool function where it takes, instead of sending that filter to the far side of the device, it allows NetConf to go out and specifically query a specific interface detail. So in this case, again, very similar format, but here I'm doing an m.get filter equals, I'm specifying XPath, and I'm specifying in the Yang model the specific piece of leaf data that I wanna see come back through. So out of my gigabit ethernet one, and I wanna see my out unicast packets, Again, the same thing. I pull that, I, I send my get, I get my response back from the device, my RPC reply back. I take that information, I process that XML, and I'm gonna print that information out. And what we see here is now this nice, clean example. XPath is a, is a great tool if I actually wanna go out and query a device for network stat, stats. So say I'm having maybe packet drops across the network and I wanna see how frequently they're, they're interacting. I can actually just write a script that actually goes out and queries uh, maybe something like my packet, my packet output drops on a platform, send it off to maybe a, a, some type of data format or maybe I'm putting it just in a, in a CSV file and I wanna plot that over time. XPath is great because I can actually just query the specific information that I want. Now, if we go in and we take a look at our configuration details, and again, what we're gonna do here is, is uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do an example, we're gonna make some configuration changes to a platform. And the way we wanna do this, we could just go through and we could actually just specify all of this code directly, or our, our configuration details in XML right in our code. We wanna use a template, and again, there's probably other ways we can do this if you're familiar with Jinja, it's an option there, but again, a very simple example here, if we take a look at this red line, I'm defining my netconf template, and I'm opening that template, and I'm gonna read it in. Now, if we go and we take a look at the next, the next screen, this is what this XML template looks like. So in this case, we've got an XML structure and we've got a bunch of essentially variable entries that are part of that, that, uh, that, that XML format. Now, again, how did I get this? Well, likely I went through, I configured this interface configuration once and then I defined my variables that, and I did a get and then I defined my variables that came out of this. Now, what happens is, is after I read that information in, I define my netconf payload. So what I have in the, the body of the code is I take that netconf uh, template and I'm gonna, I'm gonna essentially define those variables. I've had, I have uh, defined the variables as part of uh, what I'm doing here in this, uh, in, in this netconf template. I'm gonna feed that information back into the XML. It's gonna generate my netconf payload and I'm gonna use a netconf uh, edit config to send it off to the device. 
So what I have here again in that red block, we, that was what we just looked at in the previous line. So all I'm doing is I'm just printing out, hey, this is what my configuration payload is. I'm gonna send that off to maybe uh, to my terminal because I wanna look at what that configuration looks like to make sure I didn't make a mistake as I was doing that config. I'm gonna then send and edit config. So this green line or the, third, the, the second arrow on the screen, I'm doing a netconf underscore reply equals m dot edit config. I'm sending the netconf payload. So that's what I defined earlier up in that red block uh, uh, from our from our configuration example at the top, and I'm targeting my running configuration. Again, I need to specify a target because I can send this to running, I can send it to startup multiple different places, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna print the reply. And what comes back as part of that is again, this nice little clean format of again, my example. So what I'm seeing here is my netconf configuration payload. It's gonna spit out, this is essentially the XML that I'm gonna package up and send to the end device. And what I see back here is this red line at the bottom is essentially my okay is that it processed my information. It took my data and it processed it back through. So in summary, uh, net, the, the NetConf summary. So the elements of NetConf, NetConf is the transport protocol. It's how we're gonna interact with Yang data at the far side of the network. We use NC client in Python to interact or essentially to manage our NetConf process. It's how we're gonna use NetConf within Python. It simplifies our overall operation structure that we use in place. We went through a couple of examples on how we retrieve configuration and operation data from our NetConf agent. And again, very simple examples, just to kind of give you an idea of how we could start working with this. So to sum up, what did we talk about today? The road to model-driven programmability. We talked a little bit about kind of some of the challenge that we've seen historically and how moving forward and why we're starting to see this move towards model-driven programmability and essentially why we're moving away from SNMP to things like standardized data model and transport protocols to interact with from that standpoint. We talked about Yang, the Yang data model, and again, why we need a standard representation of data in the network so that essentially we're not spending a lot of time parsing out white space or, or dealing with multi-vendor environments. If everyone consistently describes something the same way, we understand how to interact with that information. And we did an introduction to NetConf and how we can actually use that to access that, that NetConf data. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Hank to kind of walk through a couple of the last summary slides. Thanks so much, Brian. Great webinar, and the questions have been fantastic, and I'm just about caught up on all of them, so I think we're in good shape. But as Brian mentioned, we've assembled a lot of webinar resources that you can dive into and kind of learn more about the topics that we've covered today. Developer.cisco.com slash netconf is kind of the homepage for all things model-driven programmability. There's been a lot of questions about finding what versions of software and how do you enable it, and that's a great resource to go through and find some of that information. We've got Learning Labs where you can get some hands-on experience with using NetConf, Yang, and even RESTConf across iOS XE and Nexus, as well as other platforms that are there. So be sure to check those out. And if you don't have a platform that can make some of these API calls, we've got DevNet Sandboxes for all of the major platforms that are there. So whether it's XE, NXOS, or XR, you can explore NetConf and Yang that are out there. So be sure to check all of these resources out as you go forward. And as always, we do like to leave these NetDevOps Live uh, events with a code exchange challenge. So we've kind of gone through and given you the basic fundamentals of how NetConf and Yang work. And for this one, I like this challenge because this kind of brings together what we know from traditional networking with CLI capabilities, as well as some of the newer NetConf pieces. So the challenge may sound more difficult than it really is. It's to use NetConf to configure basic routing on a favorite protocol. The key here, and Brian mentioned this as it goes through, is my best way that I work on NetConf for new challenges is I actually configure it um, using CLI the first time and then retrieve the final configuration from the device using something like a, an open git config from the device and then I can look and see what the payload needed to be and then make the modifications that are there. And so let's see what folks can come up with with different routing protocol configurations or other features for doing these types of configurations that are there. Looking forward to seeing all those code exchange challenges come through. And as always, we do have all of the NetDevOps uh, content and framework up on uh, DevNet for you. So developer.cisco.com slash NetDevOps is the homepage for the NetDevOps pieces and toss an extra slash live on there to see all of the information about these webinars and resources. You can find the schedule for upcoming webinars as well as all of the recordings and resources from past ones that we have. And of course, we've got the blogs, the video course, all of the pieces that are there. So I'll hand it back to you. Great, thanks, Hank. And, and again, um, appreciate everyone taking an hour uh, out of their day to, to spend some time to, to let me talk about NetConf and Yang today. I, I love this topic. I spent a lot of time talking about it. And it's, it's a great opportunity to get out. 
Uh, if you have questions, again, as, as Hank talked about, there's a lot of resources out there, but if you have questions specifically around anything I said today, feel free to reach out to me. Um, the WebEx team space, if, if, you, if you use that, the uh, if, if you're in the team space, there's a lot of really smart people that understand that this topic. Feel free to ask a question there. If it's something directed to me, I just ask that you do an at Brian Byrne in there so it tags me so I make sure that I, I, I see it. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. I've also got a GitHub repository where some of this code is located at as well. So some of the things I've done specifically around uh, some guest shell provisioning. And while there is a code challenge that's out there as well, I actually want to extend a challenge out to everyone else. So there was a, a Twitter image that made it out earlier this week uh, that, that Hank took of me uh, a few uh, months ago where I'm, I'm hugging a router like it's the end of my life. Uh, and he uses that in quite a lot of few places. I really prefer this image. Frankly, my wife prefers this image, but I've had a lot of people tell me it looks like I'm summoning a fireball. Now, I don't have Photoshop skills, so I'm putting the challenge out there. If you've got a little bit of fire or uh, Photoshop skills and can put a fireball there, get it out to me on Twitter. I'm more than happy to put together a sticker collection for you, get it out from DevNet. There's some phenomenal stickers. We'll get some Carl ones out there. I've got a couple of uh, the Harry Potter ones of, of Debbie as well. Uh, but again, that challenge is out there if anyone's interested, and I, I just don't have a whole lot of uh, 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 skills from that standpoint. And uh, with that, thank you very much. So thanks everybody for joining our webinar today. It was a great one and we will see you on the next one. Talk to you all soon.